Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Faith Life Church. Glad to have you with us today. Glad to be back. I want to get our PAL campus online with us right now. Welcome, PAL. Glad to have you with us today. And, of course, our online campus. Well, it's good to be home. Nothing like being home, although Bora Bora was pretty cool. Our 40th wedding anniversary, we went to Bora Bora. So, And we spent some time over at um, Southwest Believers Conference and then another conference up in Colorado. So we've been traveling around, but we're back. And T- Pastor Tim did a great job. Pastor Sarah did a great job. And our great team did a great job. And glad to have you all here. But again, home is where the heart is. Glad to be here today with you. If you remember, we started a series three weeks ago. Now, if you weren't here, I'll get you up to speed, but we'll get into it. And it's about occupying. Now, that's what Jesus told us to do. So we're going to start with that. Get your pencils and papers. Buckle your seatbelt. We're going to get into the Word of God today and uh, listen to what Jesus told us to do as the church. In Luke chapter 19, verse 11, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. Because, because he was near Jerusalem. Because, because this is his last journey to Jerusalem. He's going, uh, he's on his road to be crucified. And because he's heading there, he has some things to tell them. Because it says here, they thought that the kingdom of God was going to be manifest at any moment and kick Rome out. But he said this in verse 12, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minus, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. You're probably more familiar with the King James Version, which says, occupy till I come. Now, again, this is an analogy of his, what he's actually doing. He's going to come back as the king, right? But while he's gone, he gives them this instruction to occupy. I believe, generally, the church has little understanding of what he's talking about. The church has the mindset of conquering, you know, conquering the devil, you know, conquering. But, friend, the conquering is over. The conquering has already happened. The victory has already been won. Jesus didn't say go and conquer. He said to occupy. So we're going to talk about that. We talked about this again three weeks ago, but let me bring you up to speed. Occupy, according to the dictionary, means to fill a space. The chair you're sitting in is occupied. You you own it. You possess that space. Or it means to possess or control a territory. Our command is to occupy. Again, most of the church is ignorant of what this really is talking about. It's a completely different mindset. You know, to conquer is a mindset, but to occupy is a completely different mindset. So again, we need to understand what that's about. Now, three weeks ago, again, I'm reviewing here. Occupation is not as much about power as it is about administration and delegated authority. I want you to catch that phrase, delegated authority, because it is really the reason why I believe the Lord is launching this series. Most people pray for power. They sense the lack of the anointing or they sense the lack of power and they believe they need to ask for more power. Friend, you have all the power there is. The Holy Spirit lives within you. You've been anointed by the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You already have the power. The problem people have is understanding authority. They don't understand how power has the legal right to flow into a situation. That is through authority, and people have never learned really how authority flows through a kingdom into uh, the world and changes things. Okay, so we don't need to pray for more power. We need a revelation of authority, and then power follows that, all right? Okay, let's talk about Ephesians, the first chapter. I'm not going to cover it, but we've covered it last session. In Ephesians, the first chapter, Paul was writing to this church and telling them and reminding them, praying for them, that their eyes would be open to what Jesus actually did for them and the power that Jesus had, how he upturned and overturned the powers of the enemy and totally destroyed them and how he has been given that place above every name that can be named. And the Bible says he is now seated, say seated, seated. at the right hand of the Father. The term seated at the right hand of the Father infers authority. 
Now, if you follow that to chapter two, it says, we, the church, are seated, raised up and seated with Christ in the same place, seated with Christ. Again, speaking of authority that you have. So we said three weeks ago, if we're seated, we're ruling, right, with Jesus, but how did Jesus carry his authority in the earth realm? How did he minister? How did he manifest that here in the earth realm? We went through several examples. I'm going to read one for review from last time in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 1. It says, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, now again, I emphasized last time, he said, said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers said, that's crazy. This guy's blaspheming, right? Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, help me out, which is easier to, to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the, he did not say to God. He did not ask God to do anything. He said to the issue. We spent a lot of time talking about that. He spoke to the issue, okay? Get up, take your mat and go home. The man got up, went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with all, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. Now, Jesus was spoken about, saying about him, that he speaks as someone who has authority. He speaks. He does what? He speaks as someone who has authority. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20, Jesus has already been resurrected. He meets his disciples. They came to, came to him and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Now, Jesus did not have all authority until he was resurrected on earth. Satan had some legal grounds here to stand back and stand against the kingdom of God. But nevertheless, when he beat the devil and conquered sin and conquered the kingdom of darkness, he now has all authority. Thus, he's now deputizing this church, anointing them to go on a mission. What is that mission, by the way? To occupy. Say to occupy. To occupy. Okay, we need to understand that. You don't need more power. You need to know how to occupy. Now, in Isaiah chapter 9, I want to just review this quickly. I like to read this at Christmas, but it fits in any time of year you want to read it. Verse number 2 of chapter 9 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's, Midian's defeat. Now, you remember the story, Judges chapter 6. Midian, Amalekites, came in and overtook the land of Israel. The Israelites were in the caves hiding. God raised up Gideon to bring deliverance. The Bible says the army and the numbers of people were innumerable. There was no hope for Israel. But yet they were... De uh, defeated and Israel had won over them. And so as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that <clears throat> burdened them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire. Why? Because from to us a child is born and he, uh, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. He's the head of this government. So the battle's done. This prophetic voice here is uh, speaking of this battle. It's finished. Jesus conquered, and you can burn the boots. You can, it's over with. And uh, Jesus, this new government is coming into the earth realm. You got that picture so far? A new government is coming into the earth realm. All right. Matthew chapter 16, 18, uh, Jesus was accused of casting demons out by the power of, of Satan. And Jesus said, I say unto you, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, 
shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, meaning the walls are down, friends. Satan has no defense. Go forward. That's what he's really saying. Satan has, he's done. It's finished. The gates are down, and gates are defensive, by the way. There's no defense. He has no defense. You have been given my authority to advance. Now, start today's lesson. That was review. I I recommend getting that uh, message to get the full picture. But what Satan does not want you to understand about authority is what we're going to talk about now. A police officer, I did mention this last week, a police officer stops a huge multi-ton vehicle, not because of the man, but because of the badge. The truck driver is not afraid of the man. He's afraid of the badge, which represents the government that backs him up. We know with Adam and Eve in the earth realm, Genesis chapter 3, they were anointed and uh, they were crowned, the Bible says, with glory and honor, glory, the power of God, the anointing, and honor, the position. Now, he didn't really have a crown on his head, but yet he ruled like he did in behalf of how a king operates. A king speaks, he does wear a crown, and the crown represents what? The authority, but it also represents the entire government that backs up his words. He's seated. He's not fighting. His army does that, right? His government backs that up. And of course, you say, okay, who backs up the word of God? We said that last time, the angels. Hebrews 1.14 says every single angel is a ministering spirit sent to minister on behalf of those who inherit salvation. So our words, we speak Angels, the government of God backs up God's word in the earth realm spoken by the church. Are you getting this? All right. Jesus spoke and Lazarus came out of the grave. He spoke to that fig tree and it died. You see, he, see when you know you have authority, you don't have to go through all kinds of hoops and hoop, you know, hooping and hollering and screaming Jesus over and over again. You know, you simply speak. And when you're confident you have the authority, you'll act like it, knowing the kingdom of God backs up those words, and you don't have to have a second thought about it. It's done. When you speak it, it's done. Now, on the other side of the coin, the Bible does say you will be judged for every idle word you speak. Why? Because you're releasing the kingdom. And you'll be, it'll be judged in the sense you'll be judged for that effect, what you've done with that. But you need to understand that. Now, today we're talking about this about that police officer. He has authority. That truck stops. But we need to understand, and this is the message we're getting into. He speaks. He has jurisdiction over one area. He's in one state or he's in one city. He has the badge, right? He has the authority. But if he would travel out of state, he does not have that jurisdiction, correct? Now, he looks like a police officer. He has a badge like a police officer. He knows the verbiage of a police officer, but he does not have the authority. And the Lord said, my people have not been taught how delegated authority operates. They're out of place. They don't know how to flow. See, authority cannot flow through a disjointed system. It flows from the king down through a government. See, most Christians view it's me and God. And it is you and God with your salvation and your heart. But it is not you and God in reference to the government. Positions, authorities, how you operate in the earth realm. This is outside, or I say a separate function of your life. You are a Christian. You're going to heaven. Your salvation is secure in Christ. But as far as your position in this government, it's not up to you. Jesus is the head of this government. All right? And he said, my people do not understand delegated authority. That police officer does not not have authority every place he walks. He only has authority that has been delegated by those that have authority to him. All right? So our job, again, is to administrate occupation, not to enforce victory. That's the angel's job. We don't enforce the victory. We occupy which is administrate the victory. Let's talk about that. An example, World War II. On August 15th, 1945, Japan surrendered to the Allied powers and the Supreme Allied Commander, U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. 
Now, his first item on his agenda was to remove the weapons from the Japanese army. At that time, at their surrender, their army numbered about 7 million people. They were able to remove or demilitarize 88% of that army in three months. Then destroy the weapons. And then number two on his list was they had to reform the Constitution or basically re rebrand, if you will, relaunch, if you will, redesign, if you will, the nation of Japan. Because as you know, they had emperor worship and the whole structure was not conducive to freedom. So what they did is they designed a new constitution, built much of it around the U.S. Constitution. On uh, November, let's see, November 3rd, 1946, they put this new constitution in place. It specified they could not have an army which is why we put bases there, because we were their only protection. Now, the occupation, I said occupation, you understand, occupation, lasted from the end of the war in 1945 until 1952. Now, during that time, one million allied servicemen served in Japan during that occupation. My question to you is this, what were they doing while they were there? They were not fighting the Japanese. They were not there with a mindset to conquer the Japanese. Why? They'd already surrendered. So what were they doing? They were rebuilding the nation. They were rebuilding the nation under this new government, new constitution, rebuilding it, changing its structure, changing how their government worked, rebuilding the nation. That's our job. See, Jesus already conquered, and now we're here to change dysfunction to function, sickness to health, poverty to prosperity. Under our new government that is coming into the earth realm, the kingdom of God, we are not conquering the earth realm. We are administrating the kingdom's laws into the earth realm. Making sense so far? You getting this? All right. Rebuilding the nation. Let me give you another example. Hebrews chapter 11, 32, 33. And of course, Hebrews 11 is this list of fame, you know, all the faith miracles these guys did. And finally, the writer of Hebrews says, I can't, I can't, you know, there's endless stories. But he says, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. So, after conquering, what happens? Administer injustice. So you'll never occupy something that's not been conquered, right? And you'll never enjoy something that you've conquered without knowing how to administrate it. Taught that many times. You can own a field. You've conquered it. You own it. But if you don't know how to administer seed to it, harvest from it, there's no benefit, right? So... And then he says, if you learn how to administrate it, you can gain what was promised, you'll gain the effect of it. But what I'm talking about here is administering justice. So let's define our terms. Administer means to dispense or apply. Justice means the administration of law. So if we are occupying, what are we doing? We are administering what law? The law of the new kingdom. We're administering, we're applying it and dispersing it, setting captives free, It's the law of the kingdom. They're now under that law. See, we can bring them, when they come under that new kingdom's law, they enjoy the benefit of the kingdom's law. We are to disperse the laws of the kingdom. We're not conquering the enemy. He's already conquered, but we are administering it to the citizens. Making sense? Okay. Now, Satan's most successful strategy to hinder the church is that people do not understand delegated authority. Now they understand, well, I won't say they all do, but they're they're getting understanding of authority, but we need to understand delegated authority if we're gonna be effective. To look at that, we're gonna look at a very famous story of the centurion in Matthew chapter eight, verse five. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, of course that's a Roman officer in the military, asking for help. 
Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and suffering greatly, terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. I want to stop there and add this tidbit. You'll never believe anyone's word that you don't honor. The fact he said, I'm not worthy, he put Jesus higher than himself. He knew proper respect, thus he could receive from him. So the enemy's tactic is to tear down all authorities. Gossip tears down authorities, criticism of authorities. He wants to make everyone equal or raise your thoughts higher than those in authority. So understand the the plot here. Okay. The centurion said, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say, notice his emphasis on I say. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. Verse 13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done as you have believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Now here is a, Jesus was so impressed because this guy understands it. Jesus is the head of a government that he's bringing into the earth realm, and this guy gets it. So let me explain it this way. This guy is under authority, and he's over people as their authority. So he is under authority by various commanders in the Roman army, and of course Caesar is the head of that government. So let me just kind of let you know what this sounds like. When he speaks to his soldiers, it sounds like Caesar's voice. When he receives a command from his commanding officer, it sounds like Caesar's voice. When you speak, it sounds like Jesus' voice. All right? Now, what would happen if this guy decides to go over to another regiment and start bossing those soldiers around? I mean, he has the uniform. Caesar has given him authority. He knows the verbiage, how the structure works. He understands the military. What would happen if he went over to the other regiment and started bossing them around? You'd have, a bit, you'd have chaos. That army would not stand in battle. See, he has authority, but he does not have the jurisdiction. He doesn't have delegated authority for that particular regiment. All right, you're getting it. If I had all your kids over my backyard, and uh, let's just say my five kids are out there and they're young, and I said, hey, kids, it's time to come and eat, only my five kids would get up and come to the house. Why is that? I don't have authority over them, you see. So it's, it's vital you understand who you are to be submitted to and who is under your authority. You see, unless you understand that, there's a bunch of problems, and you've seen a bunch of problems. You see, business people have seen this happen all the time. Now, Paul told Timothy, a pastor, he said, look, be careful who you put in charge, okay? Be careful who you put in charge. If they're immature and they don't understand this system, you're going to have problems, So he said, if a man cannot manage his household with proper respect, uh uh-uh, he doesn't qualify. Why? He doesn't understand how authority flows. He doesn't understand how the system works. And so he doesn't understand how to be under authority, God's authority, to manage his family, and then he doesn't know how to administrate authority below him to his kids. He has no clue. And if you put someone in charge like that, you got problems in your company. You got problems in your church. You got problems in your government, right? The Bible says to test them first. What does it mean to test them? Ask them to do something they don't want to do. You'll find out pretty quick. Ask them to do something. See what they say. See if they finish it. See if they did it like you said. See if they complain, like you tell your kids to clean the room. If they go, and the room's spotless, what do you do? Uh, uh-uh, that child's in rebellion. But they clean their room, it's absolutely spotless. That child is in rebellion. Their heart is in rebellion. You train the heart, not the action, right? 
Delegated authority is learned at home. That's why the Bible says there are perilous times in the end days when children are not obedient to their parents. If they don't learn it there, you got a whole civilization that's messed up. I think we're seeing some of that. Delegated authority. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil. He'll flee from you. So unless you submit to God who is the authority, you, do ha- you have no authority. The first thing is to be submitted under authority. So you have authority, but you have delegated authority. Now, the church typically interprets this scripture as singular, meaning it's me and God. I submit to God, he and me, and uh, I have authority. As I said before, not is true for you personally, but it's not true in the kingdom in regard to position, titles, mandates, assignments. So if it says submit yourselves to God, what does that mean? Well, you're gonna submit yourselves to God in your heart. You're gonna submit to the laws of God. You're gonna do what God says to do. You're gonna be where God says to be, and you're going to do it well. Yes. Well, I can just come to church, and I I like worship. You know, me and God, we're close. Awesome. But do you qualify? Do you qualify? Do you qualify for a position? Do you qualify for promotion? Do you qualify? Let's go check your car out. Let's go check your room out. Do you clean your room? How are you doing with all those assignments you currently have? See? So it's not just you and God. It's you and whoever God tells you to go under, submit to. Everyone's trained through submission, friend. No one escapes that. Everyone is trained through submission because you can't have authority unless you learn how to submit. That's just how it is. Delegation, let's talk about the word delegate, means to entrust to another. So delegated authority is, all right, so I'm the pastor of this church. I don't have authority over someone else's church, but I have authority over my church. So I have the authority. I have staff. Amy's up here. She does an awesome job, by the way. Awesome, totally. She's great. When I give Amy an assignment, she's operating under my authority. She can carry out my direction because she has my direction and she has my authority, correct? But if Amy decided one day that she's going to go start buying houses in my checkbook or she's going to start negotiating things with, you know, whatever, then I have a problem, don't I? See, she has my authority, but she doesn't have that jurisdiction, Delegated authority is, what have I delegated to her to do? Authority only follows that direction. Listen, friend, I've seen people step out in, quote, ministry and just fall flat on their face. You say, well, I thought they were called. They were called. They have giftings. They have giftings. But there's more to this. All right, let's take a look at this and discover what we're talking about. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, they, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they finally found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And what did Jesus say? Uh, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I would be in the Father's house? So this was an innocent thing. He wasn't rebellious. He was like, duh, I mean, where would you think I'd be at? Okay. Now it goes on then. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. The Amplified Version says it this way. He went down to Nazareth with them and was continually submissive and obedient to them. All right? 
Now, you would think Jesus, of course, with his assignment, why wouldn't he be in the temple? I mean, why, why couldn't Jesus go to the temple? It was not his choice. You see, Jesus had been assigned to be submissive to his parents. See, at that point in his career, his life, his ministry, he was to be submissive to his parents, right? Why? Because he wasn't mature yet. You would agree he's called, right? Okay, he's called, but he's not ready. And so he submitted himself to his parents, and what happened? He grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God and man. You see, timing is everything. Timing is everything. Now, Satan's greatest plot against the church is division. Is division because authority cannot flow through a broken system of disunity. Unity is the greatest strength of the church. Why? Because as alignment happens, that authority of the kingdom flows unhindered into its purpose of administration and occupation. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is being accused of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And Jesus says to the people there, if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive or stand. Underline the words divided and fighting. If you have a business, church, organization where there is division and fighting, you have an organizational problem that people do not understand delegated responsibility and authority. They do not understand delegated authority. They're fighting for a claim. They're fighting for position. They're, they're fighting to do it their way. Children are not obedient to parents because they think they have a better idea than their parents. And they might have the best idea on the face of the earth. I mean, you'd have to agree, Jesus is a pretty cool guy, pretty important guy. But he was not to stay in that temple. He was to be in Nazareth with his parents, working under his dad's business, learning to submit himself, learning how to deal with people. He wasn't ready. So there's a process of how a kingdom organizes itself. There's promotions that happen. There's positions that you don't call yourself to the head of the government or those that he has empowered over you recognize in your life and promote you. God speaks to people. He, he anoints people for positions. And if you are not in your delegated position, then you'll find yourself fighting against the very kingdom that you want to see advanced. I, I agree probably with ignorance, but nevertheless... Terrible times, the Bible says, happens when people don't understand delegated authority. I always say it short circuits. Short circuits the intent. Short circuits the business. Short circuit. You ever had a short circuit? It like blows up, right? You get a short circuit, a big boom, big spark. Everything shuts off. Friend, that's what's going to happen in your life. See, if everything's not aligned properly, you have a big spark, a big boom, everything goes black. The assignment of that business, its purpose disintegrates. The fellowship of the church disintegrates. There's fighting and feuding. But no, friend, you see, if we understand how government works, we understand the church, how to align ourselves properly with those that God has put over us, learn how to submit to them, trust God, and learn how to de delegate you know, and, and manage and administrate those under you, you're preparing yourself for promotion, and God will use you. Here's an example. I get this question a lot. People say, well, my, my grandma's sick, you know. We prayed for her, and I prayed for her, and prayed for her, and she died. And they're all discouraged about it. I said, well, you don't have jurisdiction over your grandma. Now, the centurion had jurisdiction over the servant because he was totally responsible for that servant's welfare. A parent can pray for a child because they're totally responsible for that child's welfare, unless they're 40 years old. You see, Isaiah 61 says, Jesus, the prophecy about Jesus, that the sovereign Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news. You see, you can't make someone do anything, but you can share the good news. 
You can tell them, hey, the battle's over, man. Sickness, let me tell you, the battle against sickness is over. That happened on the cross. Let me share with you what the kingdom of God's, its laws, how it affects sickness. Poverty, hey, let me tell you how the kingdom of God's laws, when you're a citizen of the kingdom by calling on the name of Jesus, how those laws impact and infiltrate your life because now you're living under a new kingdom, new laws, and new territory that opens up a brand new future for you. You see what I'm saying? And by the way, it's great. Take a story along. Take a video story that shows God's healing power that healed the exact same disease they have. Now that produces hope, not faith. Understand that. These signs shall follow them that believe. Signs point. Stories of testimonies like you see here every week, they point to the gospel. They do not produce faith. They produce hope. Hope demands an answer though. Hope demands how does that happen? How can I have that same result? That that plan of investigation in the word of God produces faith. But hope is the first step in faith. If I can get that person out of hopelessness to see there's an answer, they're gonna ask, how do I apprehend that answer? Then I get the word out. Then I begin to teach them the kingdom. Then I tell them about the law of this new kingdom and how to be part of this new kingdom. We are to administrate the laws of this new kingdom. Administrate, it means to disperse. Bring it to pass. Let people know. But again, it doesn't apply to position. I read a book several years ago, uh, Healed of Cancer. Janet Larson's the author about her husband's battle with cancer and how he was uh, healed of cancer. And she was a pastor's daughter, and her father had uh, launched several churches in their lifetime. She remembers one church they had launched that this guy came into the church and told her dad he's a, that he himself was a better teacher that he should be pastor of the church, that he had more knowledge, more experience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He managed to convince a few people in the church that he was right, that they should let him do that. And so without confirming with her dad, they went to church and he gets up and announces he's the new pastor. Uh, no, take it back. He, he gets up to announce he is the new pastor. And as he stood up, he couldn't speak. He couldn't speak, couldn't say a word, no sound, nothing. He could, just stood there. He couldn't, nothing would happen. She said her dad calmly got up, got the Bible, walked over to the podium and says, let's turn to Luke chapter, <laughs> into that. See, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the most talented person on the face of the earth. Unless God puts you someplace, you have no authority. And see, God knows all about everything. People look at the outward appearance, but God knows the heart. He knows where you're at on the maturity training wheel, right? He understands where you're at if your timing's right. And trust me, you don't want to be someplace that you think you want to be unless God is in it. I'll guarantee you that. I have counseled too many people that have seen that happen. Trust me, you don't want that. <laughs> but friend, the Holy Spirit will help you. This whole process works for your promotion, but we need to understand it. I have a video I want to show you, and then I'll be back. We'll conclude service. For me, growing up, I grew up in church, um, but I grew up in poverty. My parents had food stamps, and then, um, you know, there was never enough. And we heard all the lies taken out of context from the Bible, like it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know, like you hear those scriptures, and then when I was 19, I got pregnant and I was broke. I was on food stamps. I was following the same kind of path that I had been shown as a kid. And I didn't really know what to do. I did believe in tithing. And so that is one thing that from the time I was a little kid to forever, like I knew there was something about tithing, but I didn't know the rest. I was still stuck in that poverty mentality that I could never get out of. And so I carried that into our marriage. When we got married and, you know, we're a blended family, have five kids now, um, it was still kind of that same old, like, poverty debt cycle. So fast forward to a few years, few years ago, ago, we found Faith Life, and my mind on money was like, Holy crap, like, what? It had been years since I had 
taken like notes in church. Like every time I'd come in on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, I had my phone out and I'm just taking notes and taking notes and taking notes. And I hadn't done that in a long time. I wouldn't say that the message from other places is wrong or bad. I just had heard the same thing over and over and over. And then finally hearing Pastor Gary talk about kingdom and finances and becoming debt free and having a vision for your future. Pastor Gary was just talking about that on a weekly basis. And it was just amazing to be a part of that and then start to apply things that he was teaching. We looked at each other and we're like, okay, what if, what if this is real? What if this is possible? What if, like, what if this is true? And so we talked about sowing our very first seed. We're like, okay, what well, would happen? We went for a walk to a local park mm -hmm. and we both came up with a number in our head. So like, let's go for a walk. Let's think about sowing a seed that's, you know, above what we would normally do. And when we came together, we both had the same number, which was pretty awesome that we both mm -hmm. had the same exact number. And at that time, it was too much. Like at that time, we were like, that that's a, a stretch for us. for us. That is not like an easy mm -hmm. number. So when we sowed the seed, we were believing to sell our first home for a specific amount of money. I wanted to make at least $100,000 on the sale of the home mm -hmm. um, for other investments and other things. My real estate agent actually was like, there's no way you're going to get that for your house. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen. I remember standing in church, we're holding hands, we're blessing the seed like Pastor Gary does every Sunday. We're like, okay, like we're going to believe that this yep. is that this is what God has for us and for our family, and we put it in the offering, and it, I mean, it, it worked. It 100 x <laughs> It 100 x House sold for what I thought it would. We made $100,000 on the home. We were able to invest and move money around. We had offers come in that were above asking price, plus they would pay yeah. additional money to make the house close if the appraisal wasn't met. So everything worked out just as it should have, and we actually made it by the dollar amount to make that $100,000 gain because of the amount that they went over and above the appraisal. Mm -hmm. So it like was just perfect timing. You can stay where you are right now, but what is the fruit it's producing? You know, and, and so ask yourself those important questions. Is, is where I am right now, is the belief that I'm holding on to serving me or is there, is there something more? Could there be something more? Could this yeah. work? And I promise you, the teaching works. Yeah. The teaching works. And hold on to that faith and take a step out of yeah. faith and do what you can do and be obedient now and work towards the goal. We came from, I don't want to say nothing, but, but minimal. We you know what I mean? We were struggling for years, but that's where we started. And you don't see that in the beginning, but where we are now, we actually became debt free and that changed everything. You can't argue it. It, it works and it's, yeah. we're a living, breathing testimony of it. I mean, it's for you. It's for yeah. you. It is for you. There is transformation for your life and there is hope for your life. And get rid of those beliefs that are holding you back and let's move forward. Like take your step today. What will you do today, right now to take that next step of faith? Don't delay. It's time. I'm just thankful that Pastor Gary is going in warp speed that we get to be a part of that, we get to partner with that, and we can you know, help people change the kingdom because people don't really know what they don't know. you know. And just to be able to give it any type of hope or a glimpse of what it could look like to be debt free or have a great marriage or whatever that looks like to them, it's, it's just awesome to partner with that. And I'm so thankful that they do what they do. All right, great, great story, great story, awesome. So I got a question for you. Who cursed the fig tree? Who, who cursed it? It's not a trick question. Who cursed the fig tree? Jesus cursed it. How did that happen? You'll catch what I'm going to say here. How did that happen? They did it. They did it. People assume, well, God did that. They did it. So, I don't know, you're, what are you saying? The Bible says you have the keys of the kingdom. They put that in motion. They did it. When you begin to understand how this works, that you have the authority, that Jesus has given you the keys of the kingdom, they defined the 100,000. They had faith to speak that in motion. They did it. They did it. People say, I wish God would do that for me. He didn't do it. His government backed it up. 
his angels went to work, but he didn't do it. They did it. But it was in the guidelines of their faith. They had faith to speak that into existence and receive a plan from God, the Holy Spirit, to to accomplish it. But they did it. Is that making sense? That's a vital, vital, vital understanding you have to have. They did it. So stand with me today. See... (laughs) This is getting cooler all the time, man. The kingdom. You are a citizen of the kingdom. All authority has been given unto me, therefore you go and do what he did. Jesus said the same things you see me do, you'll do. You are going to administrate or disperse this new government into this sick and dying, perverted world that's been trapped in the kingdom of darkness. You're on assignment not to conquer Satan, but to bring that good news to the captives. Administer the laws of the kingdom in people's lives like that. Those kinds of stories are natural in the kingdom. They're not, they're not uh, miracles. They're, 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 not, they're not miracles. People say, that's a miracle. No, I always say, Stories like that are natural in the kingdom. That's every day. That's kingdom. And your life can be just like that. All right. Bow your heads with me today. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. It does not say seek God. It says seek the kingdom. Basically, Learn how the kingdom operates, and all of these things you'll find out are already yours. It's exactly what it's saying. Mm. Mm -hmm. There are light bulbs going off in here. I feel it in my spirit. People are going, oh, wow, okay, I get it. Okay, I, I see it. first step for you, my friend, is to be part of the kingdom. The Bible says whoever calls in the name of Jesus has the legal right to become a citizen of that great kingdom with all the benefits. It's not a religious thing. Jesus made it legal. But because you have a free will, you have to say yes. You have to validate and ratify that decision for your personal life. Every man, woman, and child So if you're here today and you say, you know, Gary, I need to know God, not the religious God. I need to know how the kingdom God, the kingdom God, you know, how it works. That all the promises are still yes. That they work just like the Bible says. That they're mine. I need that in my life. So if you're here today or if you're at Powell... Or if you're online, our campus online, and you'd say, hey, Pastor, I, I, need to, I want to be part of this prayer. We're all going to pray together. We're all praying out loud. I'd like to be part of this prayer. Just put your hand up right now. And say, I'd like to be part of this prayer. Pastor Gary, I, I want to be part of this prayer. Thank you. Who else? Come on. Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. You that have been concerned about problems in the night, waking up with anxiousness, hands up. God has an answer for you. The kingdom has the answer for you. Hands up. Online at Powell, hands up. You say, why did I raise my hand? You need to mark the spot. This is the day I said yes. When trouble comes, I don't have to be moved by it. I have an answer. The Holy Spirit will give me the answer. I I can hold to this date. You can fight with this date. On that day, I said yes, and God promised me when I said yes, I became a citizen, which means I have legal rights in his kingdom, and I'm going to make a claim on justice, the administration of his kingdom's law right now. Anyone else? Hands up. Say, include me in this prayer. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's all pray. Say these words with me. Say, Father, you said in your Bible that if I call on the name of Jesus... You'll receive me, make me brand new on the inside. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how the kingdom operates 
I need that. So Jesus, today I say yes. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. I receive your goodness, the kingdom. Amen. 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 You can have a seat.